Good Monday, friends. Let's start with some instrumental music before we launch into this, shall we? Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to the Daily Update. The main joke tonight is my hair. The longer it gets, the wavier it gets. There's not much I can do about it. I'd forgotten how wavy my hair is. You can see it's curling all over the top. I'm thinking about going with the Liberace look. I may have to get some dye and dye it also. All the colors of the rainbow. Actually, I do have a real joke for you. Why do scuba divers always fall backwards out of the boat? Because if they fell forwards, they would still be in the boat. News, I don't really have any, but what I do want to do is offer some thanks and make some observations about Easter. I want to thank my wife, Anne Marie, for helping me set up for the Easter sunrise service. We had beautiful weather. I found a place in the yard where the sun would be coming up right over my shoulder. I only had a few technical glitches doing it. I want to thank Wendy and Brittany and Gabe and Mose for providing music for our service, our 11 o'clock service. You did a great job. I want to thank Stacy for the children's message. I want to thank Miles for reading the scripture. And I want to thank Doug Harwood especially for taking all of those different pieces and putting them together into a wonderful, wonderful service. So thank you for making that a wonderful Easter day. I want to thank Harrison Foster for continuing to post some inspiring music on our church Facebook. And also I want to thank Ed Garrison for doing what he always does well, which is taking beautiful pictures. It was very moving to me to see the cross out in front of the church and to know that there were families going by and having their pictures taken with the cross like we always do. A little bit of normalcy in the midst of a very abnormal time. So thank you to Sarah Cope and Lisa Anthony and Claude and Elaine Jenkins for putting that beautiful cross together for us and reminding us of who we are at St. Andrews. Also, I want to thank Doug Harwood and his team for putting together food to take to the Wilmington Street Men's Shelter. We would have been taking them fish on Friday, but Doug said we made a commitment to help feed those folks, and they got that food together and took it down there for them. It was not prepared. They prepared it there, but they did have the food, and I, just, I praise God for that outreach effort. And I know it means something to the people who work at the shelter and for the men who were there. And I know that it is a great example to our community of what the church is all about. So that's the news. Updates for today. Prayers for Sarah, little Sarah Daniels, who's six years old. Sarah is former St. Andrews member Patricia Bonder's great niece. And they, she's got a high fever and she's already tested negative for the flu. And they're afraid that she may have COVID-19. So prayers for little six-year-old Sarah Daniels. We want to lift up folks in nursing homes. Right now, there have been over 3,600 deaths in nursing homes across the country from this virus. And there are three 
are four major outbreaks at nursing homes in our area. Also in prisons, we now have uh, an outbreak in the prison here in Johnson County. And I guess the thing that makes it so terrible about nursing, ho nursing homes and prisons is that the people who are there can't leave. There isn't anywhere for them to get away from it, that they are captive to this outbreak. Along those same lines, I've heard several stories recently of cashiers in Walmarts, grocery stores, uh, Lowe's, hardware stores, who were right there in the line of fire. And I know I I, uh, I had to go to Walmart this morning. I hate, I hate going out right now. I feel like I'm walking into a toxic environment, but I just noticed that the Walmart employees were wearing gloves, which make absolutely no difference. Because if they touch something that's contaminated with those gloves, unless they take the gloves off immediately and then they handle something of yours with those gloves, it's contaminated. If they take the gloves off, they're probably gonna contaminate their hands. That doesn't do anything. What they should be doing is wearing masks. And I only saw about two of them with masks. Walmart should be providing masks for all of their employees. So pray for the employees in these places, grocery stores, Walmarts, Lowe's, Targets, all the places that are continuing to serve us in this time of pandemic. They are in the line of fire. I want to lift up the people of New York City as they continue to struggle with this. Also, I saw some terrible pictures from Detroit today where people are dying at such a rate that they can't keep them in the morgues and the hospitals. They're having to put them in extra rooms. And also, New Orleans has had a terrible outbreak. We want to lift up those cities. I'm also very troubled about these renewed calls to reopen. I don't really know what that means even, to reopen the states. I, I thought that it was a state-by-state -state decision and even a city-by-city -city decision about what would be open and what would not be open. I don't understand what the rush is. I do know that it's costing the economy, but what is the value of all of those human lives that are gonna be lost if we reopen too soon? and we cause this thing to flare up again like pouring gasoline on a fire. So I'm praying that wisdom will prevail in this case and we will try to get through this and flatten the curve. The curve's not flattened yet, folks. We just, we, we haven't even really turned the corner. And so I have considerable concerns about that. We don't wanna forget the terrible storms that went through. We had, it was like a mini hurricane here for about 30 minutes um, and West of us, it was much worse. As far as I know, I've read about 30 people have died and there's over a million people without power. I don't know how any of you did, I haven't heard. I hope everybody is okay with nothing more than a few limbs down and maybe a few shingles blown off of your roof. I hope no one was hurt. But we did. on top of everything else to have these storms with the pandemic would be very difficult. So prayers for all of those folks. I wanna to read to you tonight uh, by way of a reflection something from the late Henry Nouwen, who was a Roman Catholic priest and probably one of the best known Catholic priests to Protestants. It is a letter that he wrote to his friend Mark about his encounter at a piece of, with a piece of art in Grunewald. Uh, the letter was written uh, many years ago. I'll just read you the letter. My dear Mark, Yesterday, I went with some friends to Colmar, a French town in Alsace, an hour from Freiburg by car. We went there to take a look at the Eisenheimer altar. You've probably heard about it already. You may even have seen it. For me, it proved to, proved to be a very profound experience. The Eisenheimer altar was painted between 1513 and 1515 for the chapel at the hospital for plague victims in the small village of Eisenheim, not far from Colmar. The artist was a man of such a retiring disposition some say very melancholic as well, that historians are still unable to agree who he actually was. According to most authorities, Matthias Grunewald was the creator of this masterpiece. In it, the whole pictorial art of the late Middle Ages is summed up and brought to its highest point. This work is not only the most spectacular altarpiece ever made, but also the most moving. And let me stop there. If you want to know what this looks like, go to Google and type in Eisenheimer Altar, and you can see a picture of it. The altarpiece is a multiple series of panels. The front panel depicts Jesus' death on the cross. On the second, Grunewald has painted the Annunciation, the birth of Jesus, and his resurrection. On the third, which actually consists of two panels on each side of a group of sculpted figures, you can see the temptations of St. Anthony in his visit to the Hermit Paul. Although I had read two booklets by Wilhelm Nyssen before visiting this altar, the reality surpassed any description or reproduction. When I saw the body of Jesus on the cross, tortured, emaciated, and covered with abscesses, I had an inkling of the reaction of the plague-stricken and dying sufferers in the 16th century. 
On this altar they saw their God with the same ulcers as their own, and it made them realize with a shock what the incarnation really meant. They saw solidarity, compassion, forgiveness, and unending love brought together in this one suffering figure. They saw that in their mortal anguish they had not been left on their own. But they saw, too, when the front panel was opened out, that the tortured body of Jesus, born of Mary, had not only died for them, but also for them had risen gloriously from death. The same ulcerated body they saw hanging dead on the cross exudes a dazzling light and rises upward in divine splendor, a splendor which is also in store for us. The two Anthony panels on both sides of the dramatic statuary reminded the plague-ridden sufferers that sharing in the divine glory of Jesus demands a readiness to share in his temptations as well. Anthony was the patron of the monastic order that nursed the plague victims, and his life showed, without any cheap sentimentality, that those who would follow Jesus are bound to have a narrow and frequently rocky road to tread. I remained at the Eisenheimer altar for more than three hours. During that time, I learned more about suffering and resurrection than from many days of reading. The crucified and risen Christ of Matthias Grunewald is carved so deeply into my memory and imagination now that wherever I go or stay, I can call him to mind. I now know in a completely new way that if I am to succeed in fully living my life in all its painful yet glorious moments, I must remain united to Jesus. I found this to be a very touching reflection from the late uh, Father Nowen, particularly because this was painted during a time of plague, just as our own time is. And I hold on to that as well, and I hope you do too, that no matter what happens, you and I are called to remain united to Jesus. There's nothing that we're going through that he hasn't already gone, gone through in our stead and in our place. Today, our target for prayer is scientists who are working on treatments and cures and devices to help us get past this terrible disease. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Loving God, your desire is for our wholeness and well-being. We hold in tenderness and prayer the collective suffering of the world at this time. We grieve all of the precious lives lost and all of the vulnerable lives still threatened. Be with the doctors and nurses and researchers and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those who are affected and who put themselves at terrible risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace. We ache for ourselves and our families and friends from whom we're separated and for our neighbors, all of us standing before an uncertain future. And we pray that love and not fear or greed might go viral. Help us to practice social distancing and reveal to us new and creative ways to come together in spirit and in solidarity. Inspire our leaders to discern and choose wisely and to align with the common good. We pray that they would not force those of us who are isolated to prevent the spread to go back too soon into the crowds and cause this terrible disease to spread even further. Call us to profound trust in your faithful presence. We lift these prayers up to you, the God who never abandons us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, friends, and a better tomorrow. God bless.